Hello everyone. My name is Ruchit Agrawal. I'm a PhD candidate at the Queen Mary University of London. And my co-author is Professor Simon Dixon, who is also my supervisor. And we work at the Center for Digital Music at QMUL. So today I'm going to present our work titled Learning Frame Similarity Using CME's Networks for Audio to Score Alignment. And I would like also to thank MIP Frontiers for funding the research as part of this project. So let's get started. First of all, what is audio to score alignment? So as we might know, a piece of music could be represented in multiple modalities. It could be represented as an audio file, which contains a recording of the performance, or it could be represented by an image of the sheet music, or it could also be represented as a computer readable score representation. So given two such representations corresponding to the audio and the score for a given piece of music, the audio to score alignment task entails finding an optimal mapping between these two input streams. It could be visualized as shown in the right. So the alignment path is shown by red dots. And as we can see, for each position in one input stream, we find the corresponding position in the second input stream to generate the alignment path. This is done by using a feature representation for both input streams, then computing the distances between the features, and then using different kinds of alignment methods. So standard methods for alignment are based on dynamic time warping or hidden marker models, which are shown by the figures here. The first two figures show dynamic time warping and the last one shows a hidden marker model. So these methods generally employ handcrafted features. So using such features impedes self-learning, that is the ability to learn directly from data and also adaptability, that is the ability to adapt to different test domains. So now we want to replace the feature engineering step by using trainable or learnable features, which are learned from data directly using neural networks. But rather than learning features per se, we propose in this paper an, a method which learns frame similarities between the two input streams for each pair of frames. So the idea is to learn a pairwise frame similarity matrix. And we employ a Siamese convolutional neural network architecture to learn these similarities and construct a frame similarity matrix. In this image, we show a binary matrix which depicts the frame similarities. But we will see later in the slides that we will use binary as well as non-binary similarity matrices. So once we have this matrix, we feed it to a DTW formulation, which yields the alignment path using dynamic programming. So now I'll show you the model pipeline that we employ. So the inputs to, to our Siamese CNNs are pair, pairs of frames for corresponding to the score audio and performance audio respectively. These are passed through four convolutional and pooling layers and finally through a dense layer to generate the embeddings. Our goal is to minimize the distance between these embeddings for semantically similar examples and to maximize the distance for the examples which are distant from each other semantically. So this is how we will train our Siamese network. The, we back propagate through the network and minimize the contrastive loss, which we'll explain in the next slide and compute the warping path once we have the simulated matrix. So this is the detailed architecture of our model. As I said, we use four convolutional layers, pooling layers, then a flattened layer to make it a one dimensional vector and then a fully connected layer. And the first, for the first two convolutional layers, we use convolutions of size five cross five. And for the next two convolutional layers, we use convolutions of size three cross three. So now we talk about the loss function. So as I mentioned, we use the contrastive loss during training as opposed to a standard classification loss like cross entropy. 
Now we use this because it's a distance based loss, which ensures that semantic semantically similar inputs are clubbed together in the embedding space and which are the examples which are far away from each other. They are clubbed, not, they are not clubbed together, but they are further apart in the embedding space. So in this example, Y is the label which shows if the two input pairs are same or not. And X are the two inputs and W are the set of parameters. And this equation should, gives the contrastive loss where Y is zero for the same examples and Y is one for dissimilar examples. So in case it's zero, we just take half of the Euclidean distance squared. And in case of one, we take the maximum between these two values where M is the margin, which for dissimilarity. What this margin means is that, for examples, which are already too distant from each other in the embedding space, we don't count them in the loss function. They don't contribute to the loss function because they are already distant enough. But confusing or difficult examples, which are not too sure whether to classify them as similar or not, these count towards the loss function. So that is the role played by the margin. End. And GW is the output of each twin network for the inputs X1 and X2 given by this equation. Let's know this. So we'll show example inputs for our model, which are given by at each instance, we pass on a pair of these to the network. So for instance, one input would be the pair first and second, which is the anchor is the original frame and the similar is the frame which matches with it. And another input for each such matching pair, we also find randomly select a non-matching pair using the MIDI information in order to have a balanced training set. So as you can see, the first two examples are similar and the one and three is dissimilar. So, and for this computation of the similarity matrix, we use two kinds of labels, two kinds of labels. One is the binary labels and one is the distance, distances. So for the binary, we compute the output of the Siamese network, which shows if they match or not. And for the distance, we just take the Euclidean distance computed by the matrix, but not the output by the, of the CMS network. And then using this matrix, we pass it through full DTW computation to generate the alignment path. So now we'll talk about some optimizations which we used for, our, for improving the performance. So when we observed manually the outputs of our baseline Siamese networks, we found that the false positives greatly outnumber the false negatives. So we speculate that this might be due to the redundancy in the terms of the representations. So in order to mitigate these, we used, we explored the usage of deep sequence representations, which emphasize the pitched content in, a, in the CQT input of the audio. So, and also we also employed data augmentation for training our models because we don't have a whole lot of data for training the models. And also in the real world, pianos are not always tuned, tuned perfectly to A equals 440 Hertz. And often the relative intervals are also not tuned properly. So in order to add some kind of invariance to slight uh, imbalances in tuning or slight discrepancies we add 20% additional training samples by employing a random pitch shift of up to 30 cents using Librosa. Now we'll talk about the experiments. So we train our models on the combination of the maps and the Saarland database, both of which contain media aligned piano sounds. And for testing, we test on the Mazurka data set, which contains recordings from as early as the early 1900s. So the recording conditions are really diverse and there are some files containing a lot of noise and so on. So it really tests the adaptability or the performance on real data of our models. And for, from the MAPS data set, the ones, the recordings played using the Disclavier from the MES folders, the MES folders are the ones which contain entire recordings, entire pieces of music, as opposed to single chords or notes and so on. So only those recordings are retained and the rest are discarded. <coughs> and we conduct experiments using the short time Fourier transform, CQT transform, 
and chroma representations and deep sequence representations. So different feature representations, so to say, for both binary as well as distance, distance matrices, which are used as the similarity matrix form. And we compare our results with three different pre-existing methods for audio to score alignment, namely match, uh, DTW, uh, full DTW using chroma and chroma features and a multi-layer perceptron model, which, is, which also uses binary similarity values computed using a multi-layer perceptron model. And this is the model nomenclature for our models where we, just, we call them SCNN underscore or the subscript is the feature representation used. Um, and also for models with data augmentation, we also mentioned before. So in the next few slides, this will be helpful to understand the results. Now we'll show the results of our models. So as you can see, the SCNN models perform better than the previous three models. And also the distance matrix yields better results than using the binary matrix. And specifically, the salience representations when combined with data augmentation generate the best results for most cases. Um, but for when we use the binary matrix for long-term alignment, uh, long-term as in the error, which is less than 100 milliseconds and 200 milliseconds, which is not really long-term, but relative to the long-term to 25 seconds milliseconds. So in those cases, the model using salience representations performs better. So we, as we can see, the SCNN models outperform match DTW chroma as well as MLP semigram. And we speculate that thresholding the similarity into binary labels discards useful information, which is why the distances uh, probably perform better since they facilitate the algorithm to make better long-term decisions since we have more fine-grained information. And also, so you emphasizing the pitched content makes it easier for the model to learn meaningful features because uh, especially in the data scarce condition that we are in, uh, using these salience representations, it, it kind of helps the model to learn the important features from inputs. And to conclude, we, we conclude that the frame similarity learned from the data using Siamese networks is effective at complementing DTW, which is dynamic time warping, to generate robust alignments. We also show that our model offers the ability to learn directly from data, which provides higher relevance and adaptability, especially when we test on Mazurka data set. It really tests the adaptability and uh, in order to perform even better on such data sets, if we can train the Siamese network on data sets, which contain the same acoustic condition in the training. So, so in that sense, the same deep salience representations as well as our Siamese networks, both are trainable and hence they are adaptive. We also showed that using salience representations and data augmentations, data augmentation aids training and improves alignment accuracy. And one current limitation that we would like to handle in the future is the presence of structural changes in the audio from the score. And we have already worked a bit on this and hopefully I can give you updates about that in the future. So thank you for listening and do let me know if you have any questions. These are the references for the slides and this is the acknowledgement for the project. Thank you for funding the research. MIT Frontiers. And thanks again for listening and please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.